of, he's speaking as a fellow believer, he's speaking as a brother in Christ to other brothers and sisters in Christ. And so he, really he softens his tone here by beginning with my brethren. And notice then from there it leads to the, to the prohibition. And he says, my brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Now, if you were able to read Greek, and I'm not going to stand up here and say I can read all of it, but that last two words, with favoritism, is in what is called the emphatic position. It would place it at the beginning of the sentence. And so it would read, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, or rather it would start out with favoritism, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do not with respect of persons hold your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the, uh, the idea of favoritism here, it's used in the plural. And it's speaking of acts of partiality, acts of favoritism, which would include all the various ways in which this term is used or the ways in which partiality may be shown. So the idea of the emphatic position is giving a special force to the imperative, to the command that follows, and it carries the idea of a continuation of not making the practice of partiality or favoritism. This is basically one word. In the Greek, it's prosopalimpsia, and it has the literal meaning of lifting up someone's face with the idea of judging by appearance and on the basis of giving special favor and respect. Now, we think of that idea of judging, and immediately we think of Matthew chapter 7. And there, that's judging in terms of sin. He says, judge not and you shall not be judged. And people quote that many times when you're confronting their sin. And you have to go, wait a minute, let's read the rest of the passage because that's not what it means. The essence of the passage is saying that as I confront you in your sin, I have to make sure I've confronted myself first. I have to make sure I have the, the two by four or the four by eight beam protruding out of my eye. I have to make sure I've gotten that out before I can get that little speck out of your eye. So I have to deal with that first. But here he is talking about judging someone on the idea of their appearance. And, and then looking at their appearance and giving them a special attention, special favor. It would be like right now if the mayor walked in or the governor or the president walked in. We'd all be going, whoa, whoa, here, come sit right here, sit right here, sit right here. He'd have a multitude of places to sit, wouldn't he? Because everybody would be moving out of his way. Or maybe it was somebody else that walked in here that was very influential and, and we would seek to give them a good seat. And here James is going to address something like that. And yet he, he deals with it with the rich and the poor as we look at the text. But again, the idea of, of favoritism, as it's used in that term, it, it pertains to judging purely on a superficial level without any consideration of a person's true merits, without any consideration of their abilities or their character. Now, while Jesus was on the earth, he emulated his father by showing no favoritism to anyone. In fact, even his enemies acknowledged that. In Matthew twenty two fifteen, it says, Then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him and what he said. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and you teach the way of God in truth and defer to no one for you are not partial to anyone. So even his enemies recognized the impartiality of Christ. In fact, when you even consider his human birth and his family and his upbringing in Nazareth, even his willingness to minister in Samaria and, Gal and Galilee, regions which were basically held in contempt by the Jewish leaders, you see that Jesus was impartial. Jews would not go through Samaria. They would go around. And Jesus said, I must needs go through Samaria. He had a divine encounter with a Samaritan woman. He was impartial. In fact, to show his impartiality even more, he stayed there two days in presenting the gospel to them. Well, James says, and you'll notice the command, he says, do not hold. 
That is a command. In fact, that's the Greek verb echo. Echo means to have or to hold or to possess. Do not hold, present tense. Do not continue to hold. Command or imperative. He's trying to tell them, stop doing this. This is indicating an action that was already going on. They were already doing this. Some of you may do this. Some of you may feel in your heart that you have a little bit different feeling toward each other, where you treat one better than the other. Douglas Moo, he says, favoritism based on external considerations is inconsistent with faith in the one who came to break down the barriers of nationality, race, class, gender, and religion. And as Paul says, here there cannot be Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free man, but Christ in all and in all. He says, so do not hold, do not continue to hold the faith. The faith points to the well-known faith of Christians that's embodied in the gospel. Do not hold the faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. That could literally be read back this way, our Lord Jesus Christ of the glory. Perhaps referring to God's Shekinah glory. Glory is doxa, and it refers to a divine and heavenly radiance. You remember in Matthew 17 when Jesus transfigured himself before his disciples, Peter, James, and John, he showed his glory, his doxa. Well, to enforce the command and the prohibition in verse 1, James gives an illustration. And look at the illustration in verse 2. He tells us basically two men enter the assembly. He says, if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes. So we see two men come into the assembly. One is rich and the other one is poor. One has fine clothes on, the other one has smelly, poor, shabby, dirty, filthy clothes. That's the idea of the term. And the idea of the fact that he mentions that they come into your assembly, synagogue, which is the word for synagogue, is referring to the fact that there was a place of worship by this time. And as many commentators would argue that they were not meeting in a synagogue, they were meeting at a place designated for the church to meet. So even using the term synagogue, it would give his Jewish readers some familiarity with what he is trying to say to them. It would perk up their ears. If a man comes into your synagogue, he comes into your assembly, and you see the, the appearance of the first man, he's a man with gold rings. Every time I, I read this passage... I can't help to think about what I see when I turn on TBN, right? That's the first thing I see. I see the rings. Well, here's a man with gold rings, and he's dressed in fine clothes. The gold rings is literally gold-fingered. It's meaning that he had many gold rings. He had a ring on every finger. Interesting that the wearing of a ring was customary among the Jews. But in Roman society, the wealthy wore rings on the left hand, in great profusion, William Barclay, he tells us that there were businesses where people could actually rent rings to wear when they wished to give the impression that they were rich. So if you wanted to give an impression of being a wealthy person, you went out and bought many rings or rented many rings to wear on your fingers. And it had become certainly a problem. Clement of Alexandria he felt it necessary to urge Christians to wear only one ring, and because it was needed for purposes of sealing, they would seal documents with the ring. The apostolic constitutions warned Christians against fine clothing and rings, since these were all signs of lasciviousness. So he says, here is a man. He comes into the assembly, and the first thing that we notice, and the text points out that we notice, that he is a man with, a hand, with his hands full of rings. And not only is his hands full of rings, but he is dressed in fine clothing. And the idea of fine, it's bright, sparkling clothing. It's either referring to the glittering color of his clothes or his sparkling ornaments. You know, the rings that are sparkling on his hands. But he comes in, you notice that this man is well off. He doesn't have any needs. In fact, come on in. We're struggling in our offerings. Come, sit right here. Ushers, get the basket, quick. Now, I say that in jest, but I have been in churches for 20 years, and I've heard people literally say in a committee meeting, we don't want to lose that member because they are a good tither. 